Hey guys, uh, this is a presentation on Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium. So today we talked about Hardy-Weinberg and um, how uh, in a population that's in Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium, there'll be no mutation, no genetic drift, no gene flow, no natural selection, and no sexual selection um, on the population. Okay, so it's gonna also be a very large population as well. So uh, what we are going to talk about today is how you can mathematically prove if a population has changed over time. So we're gonna use a null hypothesis for this and we will do a little chi-squared, but the null hypothesis basically is saying that there's no significant difference from generation to generation, okay? When this is going to um, indicate that none of those characteristics that I just described um, are occurring in this population. If we do happen to see a change from generation to generation, then we know there maybe there's mutation, maybe there's genetic drift, maybe there's gene flow, possibly some type of selection acting on the population. And um, we can do a little bit more research to determine what is causing that change. Just doing these calculations isn't going to necessarily tell us what is actually causing the change, but we can see if there is a difference in the population. So we use two different equations. Um, one, and we kind of use them to help each for back and forth between the both of them. Um, one of the equations is P plus Q equals one. And this is for allelic frequencies. So the dominant allele is represented by P, the recessive allele is represented by Q. So because we're working with a two allele system, okay, the frequency of P plus Q is gonna equal one. Keep in mind that all of our frequencies that we're working with for P and Q must between, be between zero and one. Same thing here for if we're looking at genotypic frequencies. So we use the equation P squared, a P squared representing homo homozygous dominant individuals, 2PQ for heterozygous, and Q squared for homozygous recessive. Okay, and these frequencies must also be between zero and one. So when you add all three of these groups within the population together, you get a total of 100% or one. How we arrived at this equation is based off of a Punnett square that we become very familiar with. So if you think about the probability or the frequency of P in the population, okay, this probability or frequency, um, if you multiply the probability of having one P, or excuse me, a dominant allele by a dominant allele, it's gonna be P times P, because those are, those are independent events based on whether mom or dad gave that, that dominant allele or not. So that's P squared, same thing with Q squared, probability of receiving the recessive allele and another recessive allele, so Q times Q. And then because we have two heterozygous possibilities, okay, we have two PQ. So the probability of P and the probability of Q, and then there's two ways to have that happen. So we're gonna do a sample problem to practice these skills. So we're going to be looking at a population of newts, okay, with P being dominant over little p. Okay, so P is poisonous, little p is non-poisonous. We have 200 newts and 8 are not poisonous. So we want to first figure out our allelic frequency for this, for this population. Um, it's easiest to start with a recessive allele because homozygous recessive individuals um, are going to express one trait in this population and individuals that are dominant could be homozygous dominant or heterozygous. And it gets a little complex when you're, um, when you're trying to solve an equation for two variables. So we're just gonna stick to one. So if we have eight that are non-poisonous, okay, and we have a total of 200 newts, okay, eight over 200 is gonna be the frequency of non-poisonous in the population. A non-poisonous, remember this is gonna be little p, little p, which is gonna be represented by q squared. So eight divided by 200 equals q squared. I can take the square root of both of these to figure out what q is. So if I pull out my handy dandy calculator, um, eight divided by 200, is going to equal 0 0.004. We'll take the square root of that. 
that's going to equal Q. So my final answer would be 0.2 equals Q. Okay, just some algebra. So now that I have Q, remember that P plus Q equals 1. So if Q equals 0.2, P plus 0.2 equals 1, so that means P is going to equal 0.8. So the allelic frequency for poisonous is, is 0.8, for Q is 0.2. So let's take this to the next step. So if I have 50 newts washed downstream after a big storm, okay, and they colonize a new pond, what do we expect the frequency and number of each genotype to be? So I know what my expected um, allelic frequencies are. Let's figure out, using these allelic frequencies, how many of 50 newts I would expect to see. So if P, so if the big P, big P is represented by P squared, all I have to do is take 0.8 and square it. And this is going to equal 0.64. Okay, so these are going to be my big P, big P. Big P, little P, the heterozygous individuals. This is represented by 2PQ. So 0.8, oops, 2 times 0.8 times 0.2 equals 0.3. Two. Okay, at this point I could take one minus all these and figure out what Q squared is, but I'm just going to show you how to do it this way. Q squared would then equal 0.2 squared, which equals 0.04. So these are the frequencies of um, the next generation. And I know that there are 50 individuals. So I would, so if I want to say multiply my frequencies times 50, I can figure out what the total number of my new population is. So times 50 would be 32. Times 50 here would be 16 times 50 here would be 2. And remember that both of these together are going to equal my poisonous individuals. So I would have a total of 48 poisonous. And I would have 2 non-poisonous. Okay, so um, next part of the question. I count the new population of newts and I find that I have 44 poisonous and 6 non-poisonous. Okay, um, is this what I expect? Okay, and keep in mind that there is natural variation, so we want to see if this population is close enough um, to the expected population. So for this, we're going to do chi-squared, which you guys are all experts on. Remember, with chi-squared, it's going to be the sum of all my observed minus expected squared divided by my expected. So let's start this. Okay, so I expect to see 48 poisonous newts. I have 44. So 44 minus 48, which is my expected, square it, divided by 48, plus I observed 6 non-poisonous, so 6 minus 2 squared, divided by my expected 2. 
and we get a sum for this. So hang tight for a second and do some calculations. Let's skip down a little bit too. So once I've done my calculations, I'm going to have 44 minus 48, square it, divided by 48, 0.33. 6 minus 2 squared divided by 2 is going to be 8. So total of 8.33 is what chi-squared equals. Um, I will reference one of my chi-squared tables. When I look at this table, um, my critical chi-squared value okay, that I want to compare this to um, at 1 degree of freedom, because I have two groups, so 2 minus 1 um, will give me 1 degree of freedom, is... Um, 3.841 is my critical chi-squared value at, um, I believe, a probability of, um, oh, I don't want to use B, so 0.05, so 5% 5 probability due to chance. And I want to compare this number to my um, critical chi-squared value. Because this is significantly larger, that is going to indicate that um, I should reject my null hypothesis because there is um, a significant difference between my observed and expected population. So, um, and what you have to think about next is um, which of your Hardy-Weinberg um, qualifications probably which was violated. Um, this is a very small population, about 50 individuals, so I would definitely say um, there's probably a good chance that genetic drift was at play here. Um, we founded a new population that may not be representative of the initial old population. Um, there also could maybe be some new selection at this pond. You'd have to do additional research to figure out exactly um, what is causing this. Okay. Um, last thing, um, once you figure out um, if your population is different, we typically like to kind of figure out what type of selection is acting on our population and how it's changing. So um, we have directional, disruptive, and stabilizing selection. If our phenotypes are changing and kind of one um, phenotype is favored over another, we usually typically call this directional selection. So maybe in the case of our example up here, um, it wasn't as beneficial to be poisonous. So maybe the individuals were um, moving in the direction of non-poisonous because it was easier to be non-poisonous um, in this new environment, and those individuals survived and reproduced more. Um, disruptive, maybe um, this one probably doesn't apply really well here, but this will favor the extreme phenotypes, and the heterozygous individuals will disappear in the population or stabilizing, which typically favors the heterozygous individuals. Maybe those medium phenotypes will increase in frequency. So it's good to um, analyze your population afterward and see if there is a type of selection acting on it. Please bring any questions you have to class, and we will work on um, looking at the answers to some of your practice problems next time we meet. Have a good day, guys.